Hi, I'm Dr Imogen Whittam. I'm a Hintzy Fellow at the University of Oxford in the UK and I'm also affiliated with the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. I was a postdoc at UWC for five years before I moved to Oxford in 2019. I've used various radio telescopes around the world during my career as a radio astronomer so far and at the moment I'm mostly using the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa and I use Meerkat to study radio galaxies and you can hear more about this in one of the science lectures. So this lecture today is about how you choose the right parameters when you're doing your calibration and I'd like to thank Jack Redcliffe for uh, these slides. Okay, so in the previous lectures, you should have learned about calibration. And in this lecture today, we're gonna to go into some more details about how you know which parameters to set and to how them, and what to set them to. So some parameters are fairly standard, but others, for example, the phase reference solution interval can affect calibration profusely. So hopefully this lecture should give you some intuition on what to set. So one of the first things you're going to need to choose when you're doing calibration is your reference antenna. So the reference antenna is the antenna to which we compare our solutions because interferometers only care about relative differences. So a good reference antenna should be one that will have the most good solutions to all other baselines. And so typically this means it's close to the center of the array. So it's got lots of short baselines. And if you're using an array that's got different size antennas, it should be one that's got a large collecting area. And for some arrays, there will be one antenna that you generally always use as your reference antenna. Whereas with other arrays, typically connected interferometers, where all the antennas are physically the same, you might have several different options as to which one you can choose. Um, so for example, with the European VLBI network, Effelsberg is generally always used as the reference antenna because it's both close to the centre of the array and it's the largest. Okay, so you should have learned about fringe fitting in a previous lecture. And this estimates the delays and rates by fitting for a linear phase gradients. So when you're doing your fringe fitting, one of the first things you should do is look at a phase versus frequency plot. And you can see an example of this on this slide here. You can see the linear gradient of the phase against frequency, and you can see that this wraps around several times. So when you're doing fringe fitting, you can pick a delay window. So this means that the algorithm only searches within a certain range of slopes. And this can greatly speed up the algorithm. Um, but it's important that you inspect the, the phases to make sure that you're picking a sensible range for that delay window. So delays are usually stable for hours, so you can generally average over the whole, um, the whole scan. But it is important that you inspect these because sometimes this isn't true, for example, if the atmospheric conditions change dramatically or something like that. Okay, so the next stage is bandpass calibration. And just a reminder, the bandpass is the frequency dependent sensitivity across the observed frequency range. And your bandpass calibrator must be extremely bright because we need to get solutions per channel, not per subband, to track the shape across the bandwidth. So the first thing you need to do is to correct the bandpass calibrator's phase against time. Um, and then when you're deriving the band pass solutions, you need to average in time for as long as possible to get the best signal to noise per channel. And you can see an example of a band pass below where there are two different band pass calibrators. And note here that both of these band pass calibrators actually have the same amplitude wiggles as we'll see in the next plot. And here where you've got two different band pass calibrators, you could combine them interpolate between them or just use the one with the best signal to noise. And if we zoom in on the y-axis of the plot from the previous slide, 
here you can see that those wiggles are of very similar amplitude to, uh, to the other one that was shown. And some other things to note with bandpass calibration, um, you should normalise your bandpass solutions, otherwise the flux scale may differ or be unset. And if there's bad data around, you may need to select time ranges. Okay, so when we're reducing data, we're generally trying to achieve the lowest noise possible. And the lowest possible noise that you can achieve for a given observation is the thermal noise limit. And this is based on the system temperature and is given by the equation at the top of the slide here. Um, note that this equation assumes natural weighting. If you choose a different weighting scheme, for example, with the Meerkat telescope, you might want to downweight the short baselines to increase your resolution. That will increase the noise that you can achieve. So when you're calibrating and imaging your data, a good rule of thumb is that you should try to reach at least three times the predicted noise floor given by this equation. Um, and if we look at this equation, you can see that you can only improve this noise, or so minimise the noise, by having bigger or more efficient antennas, or more antennas, therefore increasing n, or by having better observing conditions, or by observing for longer, or having a wider bandwidth therefore increasing delta t or delta nu in this equation. So we're also trying to achieve the highest dynamic range possible. So dynamic range is a measure of how sensitive our observation is relative to the brighter source in the image. And one common definition of dynamic range is shown here. So this is the ratio between the peak flux in the image and the RMS noise in a nearby empty region. So in the example shown here, this is given by P over sigma, which gives you a value of about 74,000. An alternative definition of dynamic range that's sometimes used is given here. So this is the ratio of the maximum or the peak flux in the image to the peak nearby artifact. And for this example, that gives you a value of about 370. So now we're going to look at how any phase errors can affect the dynamic range that you can achieve. So let's assume that we've got a simplified array. So this is flat linear array with n antennas. And let's assume we've got a single integration observation of a point source. So because we've got n antennas, we're going to have n, n minus 1 over 2 visibilities. Remember, each pair of antennas gives us visibility. And let's assume our array is orientated such that we only need to consider the u-axis. So each baseline visibility will give us a delta function spike in the uv plane, or just the u plane in, in this example. And let's assume here that all but one of our visibilities are perfect. So they've got unit amplitude and zero phase. Um, so each of these gives us a delta function at position UK for the case baseline. So let's suppose that on one of our baselines, we've got a phase error of length U0, um, also on baseline U0, um, a phase error of phi E radians. And the visibility due to that baseline is given by this equation at the bottom of the slide. So how will that phase error affect the dynamic range? Well, remember that the image is related to the visibilities via a Fourier transform, as shown by the equation at the top of the slide. And each baseline contributes at position UK and complex conjugate minus UK in the visibility plane. So if we evaluate this term for each of our n, n minus 1 over 2 minus 1 good baselines, we get 2 cos 2 pi uk l. However, the bad baseline gives us that with this phase error difference given by phi e, which then if we assume that phi e is small, 
we can expand that to give us approximately 2 cos 2 pi u0 l plus phi e sine 2 pi u0 l. So that means that our image integral is now given by the equation at the bottom of this slide. So we've now got that sine function added at the beginning. So in this case, our synthesized beam is given by the equation at the top of this slide. And deconvolution is the subtraction of the beam from the image, which then leaves a residual error. And that's given by the equation in the middle of the slide. So the residual is the um, image, the equation from the previous slide, minus the beam, which gives this equation in the middle. And you can see here that two terms cancel out and we're left with our residual being that sine function shown. So note that this is an odd sinusoidal function with an amplitude of 2 phi e and a period of 1 over u0. So therefore, if we've got a small phase error phi e and a large n number of antennas, the, the ratio of the peak to noise residual, so the dynamic range, is given by n squared over root 2 phi e. And if we suppose that instead of a phase error, we've got an amplitude error on a single baseline, so therefore the visibility on that baseline is given by 1 plus e multiplied by the delta function at that position, we then repeat the analysis via a cos function, that would give us the dynamic range um, by the equation in red here, so we get n squared over root 2e. So the things to note here are that a phase error of 10 degrees is about as bad as a 10% amplitude error. And note that phase errors are sinusoidal, so odd functions, and amplitude errors are cosine functions, so they're even. And that's illustrated by this example here, where in the image on the left, we've got a 10% phase error on one antenna, and in the image on the right, we've got a 20% amplitude error on one antenna. And you can see that the errors are of the same magnitude in the two plots, but the plot on the right, the errors are symmetric, whereas the plot on the left, they're anti-symmetric. And this can be a useful diagnostic if you've got noticeable errors in your image and you're trying to work out how they've crept in. So the example that we've talked about so far has been assuming that there's an error on just one baseline and on one integration or scan. If we had all baselines to one antenna affected by the same error, that would give us n minus 1 bad baselines, which is approximately n if n is suitably large. So that means the dynamic range is related to the dynamic range for one baseline that we derived on the previous slide um, by n minus 1. And if we follow this equation through and assume that n is large, we end up with the dynamic range of n divided by square root 2 times by our phase error. If instead all baselines are affected by random noise, we get the equation in the middle here. So the dynamic range is related to the dynamic range that we derived on the previous slide. You might want to re rewind this video to, to look at it. And by this equation in the middle, um, which again simplifies to n divided by phi e our phase error. And note that these expressions are valid if the errors are correlated in time. So for example, for a single phase reference scan, and when there's not much change in u or v. Um, however, if we have m separate time periods or scans, and the noise is uncorrelated between them, we can increase the dynamic range by a factor of root m, where m is the number of independent scans. Okay, so if we use this and assume we've got a 10 antenna array and 12 independent scans, 
if all phase referencing has been applied and our data is well edited for RFI. We've got a typical phase scatter of about 20 degrees. Then the dynamic range that we've got will be approximately root m n over phi e, which is of order 100. Now, can we do any better than this? Well, if the map noise, so the noise that we can measure in our image, is near the thermal noise limit, which we talked about earlier in this lecture, and the remaining errors are noise, then, then no, we can't really do much better than this. However, if the noise is non-Gaussian, and if it shows errors which are quite a lot larger than the thermal noise limit, then that indicates that the telescopes are imperfectly calibrated. So we probably can do better than this. And a good way to do this is via self-calibration. And you're gonna learn more about self-calibration in, I think it's the next lecture. Okay, so when you're calibrating, you need to choose your solution interval for phase calibration carefully, as this can have quite a big impact on the results. And in general, you want the longest solution interval that you can have to increase the signal to noise without losing phase structure. So if your solution interval is too long, you will lose that phase structure. But if it's too short, you won't have a large enough signal to noise unless your phase calibrator is very bright. That's illustrated in this plot here. So this plot shows phase against time. The raw phase is shown in black. And then we've got the phases that we get with different averaging times shown by the different lines. And you can see if our averaging time is too long. So for example, 600 seconds, the green dotted line here, or 300 seconds, the magenta dash dot line we lose quite a lot of that structure um, in the signal. Okay, so we'll derive the phase calibration solutions for the phase reference source. And then we'll need to interpolate these solutions to the target source. An example is shown in the plot here, which shows phase against time. And the phase reference calibrator is shown in black and the target calibrator is shown in pinky red. It's a good idea to make a plot like this um, because you can see if the phase calibrator tracks the target phase. I mean, here you can see there is a consistent trend. Um, there are a few deviations. And note that you may well see wiggles in the target source, which might be due to structure in the field. So we need to interpolate these favor phase reference solutions to the target. And ideally, we want no more than two solutions per phase reference scan. So the plot here is the same data as the plot on the previous slide, but with 30 second averaging. And these corrections will track the phase better than if we just had one point per scan. You can see here we've got two points per scan and but just check that you've got enough signal to noise. But by eye, the, the scatter here looks okay. The next step is amplitude calibration. In general, you can use a longer solution interval for this than for phase calibration. And the best strategy is to apply the phase solutions first, then use a longer solution interval for the amplitude calibration. And this plot here shows the amplitude against time. And again, you can see the, the reference scans and the target scans. And the scatter in amplitude for each scan is usually just noise rather, rather than the larger drifts that we saw for the phases in the previous slide. So one solution per scan is usually fine for amplitude calibration, as you can see in this example here. So that's with it averaged with one per scan. So we need to interpolate the amplitude and phase solutions from the phase calibrator to the target. The most common methods for doing this are either linear interpolation or nearest. 
and this plot here shows the difference between the two. Um, we can see nearest is shown by the blue dashed line and linear is shown by the black dashed dot line. And the different, the bottom panel shows the difference between the interpolated phase and the true phase for these two different methods. And you can see that linear is often better for interpolating across the scans than just using nearest. Okay, so in conclusion, here are a few take home points. So your, uh, what counts as a good calibration solution depends on the conditions of the observation and what your science goals are. It's key that you identify a good reference antenna at the beginning. And for some arrays, there may be a standard one that's always used. Your band pass and amplitude solution intervals can be as long as possible to get a good signal to noise. But the best solution interval for phase solution depends. But this is almost always shorter than a single scan. And we ideally want our dynamic range to be as high as possible. And self calibration can be very helpful for this. And you're going to learn more about that in the next lecture. So thanks for listening.